and welcome to Fair Voice. My name is Hannah Syriac and I am your podcast host. Fair Voice is affiliated with Fair Mormon, but the opinions expressed here do not necessarily represent the opinions of Fair Mormon, the organization, or the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Thank you for joining us today. Today we have an interview with Professor John Gee, which I am really excited about. But first, please make sure that you register for the 2020 Fair Mormon Conference. The 2020 Fair Mormon Conference is August 5th to August 7th, and your ticket of $59.95 allows you to watch the conference online in real time. You can view the conference on demand immediately after the conference for the for a year. You can also submit questions to the speakers during the conference, and you receive additional perks such as free shipping on books purchased from the online bookstore during the three days of the conference, some recorded Q&As with speakers, and other downloadable goodies. I signed up for the conference, and I would really like you to, too. So please make sure to sign up for the 2020 Fair Mormon Conference. Your generous donations to us and your attending of this conference helps make Fair Mormon possible. Let's go. So today's interview is with John Gee, and I'm going to take a moment to introduce him. John Gee works for Brigham Young University, and he is a professor there. He got his PhD in Egyptology from Yale University. He is the William Bill Gay Assistant Research Professor of Egyptology at the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship, where he is also a series editor for studies in the Book of Abraham and a member of the editorial board of the Eastern Christian Text series. He is also on the board of directors for the Aziz S. Atia Fund for Coptic Studies at the University of Utah. We're really excited to have you on today. Um, we wanted to talk about the Book of Abraham with you, um, especially because How Glid's article came out and a lot of people have had a lot of different feelings about this. So could you please explain the difference between your claims and How Glid's claims of, about the historicity of the Book of Mormon? Um. Well, I think my claim, uh, my claims have been fairly clear and consistent over the years. Brian's position on on the history of the Book of Abraham has changed over the last oh eleven or twelve years. So eleven or twelve years ago, um, well, actually, let me back up and and talk about the four basic logically coherent positions that people can have on the book of Abraham. So, and it it depends on how you answer three questions, and these are interrelated questions. So the question is, is the book of Abraham inspired? Uh, Is it ancient and is it authentic? That meaning does it go back to Abraham? So I guess you could say, is it Abrahamic? And so you can answer negative to all the four, all three questions. So you get three no's, or you can say, well, it's inspired, but it's not ancient and it's not Abrahamic, or you can say it's inspired and ancient, but not Abrahamic, or you can say it's inspired ancient and Abrahamic. And, and those are all interrelated. You can answer one of those questions. So um, my position is that it is inspired ancient and Abrahamic. So I, and I've been consistent on that uh, over many years. And Brian used to be in that category. Um, But then he, at um, some point, oh, I don't know, probably between eight and 10 years ago, switched his answer to, is it ancient? And then, so that jumps you to say, well, it's not ancient, so it's um, it's either fiction or inspired fiction. I think you'd move to the inspired fiction category. I'm not quite sure if he's still there or if he's left the inspired part off these days. <clears throat> Typically, only the the two polar ends of those are intellectually stable positions. People who try to try to hold the middle ground position either can't historically either can't maintain those positions. So over time, they tend to go into the Book of Abraham as as uninspired fiction category, or 
they can't persuade their students and their children to maintain those positions. And so the, uh, once you get on the middle ground, it tends, you tend to lose um, over time the, your positive answers to any of those questions. And so, but I'm, it's not entirely clear to me which of those two camps he's in. Uh, and whether or not he thinks it's inspired. And inspired oftentimes is a fuzzy word. So you can say that for some people, inspired just means there's something vaguely inspiring about it. Or, um, or they may say, well, it's inspired, but they, that mean, they may mean, mean it's poetic. Or inspired, they could say, well, it's inspired, but inspired by the devil. Or they could say, you know, or it's inspired by God. What they mean by inspired is sort of squishy. And it's hard to pin that down. And what one person understands by that, another person may use the exact same vocabulary and mean something completely. I totally agree. And I like what you said about how inspired fiction is kind of the squishy category, because I feel like if you say that it's inspired fiction, you're not taking the text on its own terms. Um, no. And, and I think also um, one of the things about Joseph Smith's treatment of it is, you know, if you have those middle ground categories, let's say, say you say it's ancient, but it's not Abrahamic. That means it's some ancient work that's put in Abraham's mouth, um, meaning it's not actually true. It's just, um, and there's a category for that. It's called pseudepigrapha. And a lot of the apocryphal works are pseudographic. So they're attributed to somebody, but they're not actually there. And if you look at Doctor and Covenants 91, Joseph Smith had a chance to translate the Apocrypha, and the Lord told him it's not necessary. There are some things in there that are true, but there are some things that are not true. And so Joseph Smith doesn't seem to be interested in delving in, into providing inspired translations of the pseudepigrapha category. So in Joseph Smith's terms, he says, I learned, this is Abraham's reasoning, I learned it from translating a papyrus in his house. For him, it was Abrahamic, ancient, inspired, and so that it was historically authentic. And that seems to be the category that he placed it in, um, and is the category that, uh, and at least is an intellectually stable category. Uh, the, the middle ground categories, I know, People, for various reasons, find them popular. I don't find them stable, and so I tend not to. Um, it's not a category I work into. I've, I've looked enough in evidence that, to me, the simplest explanation is that the Book of Abraham goes back to Abraham. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you there. And I found your article in the Interpreter Foundation's journal really quite compelling. It was one of my favorite reads. Um, could you speak a little bit about what you said about the four idolatrous gods in that article? Oh, the four idolatrous. Well, um, so let's um, back up and, and talk a little bit about, um, so scholarship can't prove that a document is historically authentic. They can prove that it's not authentic, but they can't prove that it is authentic. And people come in with artifacts to me all the time and want me to authenticate them. And the best that I can do is say that this is consistent with an authentic art artifact. I can't say that it is authentic. But I can also, but I can point out uh, this is a forgery or this is a modern reproduction, or something like that. And, uh, and they're always a little disappointed when I do that, but that's what scholarship does. You can either say, this is consistent with authentic, but you can't say that it is authentic 
um, when somebody just brings you in this artifact. And that goes with, with so if you bring it to text like the Book of Abraham, we didn't discover this on archaeological dig. Um, we don't have the original text to test it on. All we can say is, is it a, a can, is it consistent with uh, an authentic document and with material from that time and place? So what we're not establishing is, is we're not establishing historical authenticity. We're establishing historical plausibility. This fits in with that. So that's the basis on which this article deals, where I look at are the names of the various gods in the book of Abraham, do they match with the time and place of Abraham? And that's a little hard to do because we have very little material from Abraham's time and place. There is a dispute about where, where to put Abraham both in time and place. And because my viewpoint isn't what most biblical scholars would say on it, and it's not that I don't have my reasons for it, but I generally have to lay those out briefly at the beginning of any time I talk about it is to say, this is where I place Abraham in time and in space so that we can know what it is we're comparing it with. So there are biblical scholars who would place Abraham in southern Mesopotamia before 2000 BC. And that's their time and place. And so if you're looking for comparable material, you're looking at or three economic texts that are written in Sumerian and other material from that area. I place Abraham in a different time and place. So I'm looking at different material and we're looking at a time at a place where you have to go about 200 miles before you find archives in the area from about Abraham's time, or you have to go a little bit later in time. And so as you broaden the scope of where you're searching, you get more information, but it, you're also more likely to get extraneous information. So that's the, the methodological caveat to this stuff. I try to put it as close as we can in time and place to Abraham. And, and so in my article on the four idolatrous gods, I'm looking at what we can find of those and how it fits and then what the usage of Abraham's time is so that when it says the God of Elkanah, what can that mean? And then how, do, how does it fit in? And, and what we find is that we have, um, in some cases, possible candidates for those various gods, and in some cases, probable candidates for those various gods. And that's the first step, is to say, okay, we have this god from this time and this place. But the, the next, also want to go to the next step beyond that, which is to say, well, now that we know that such and such exists, does that shed any more light on the book of Abraham. And so in some cases, it does have some, um, a wider application and, and uh, more confirming things that uh, let us know about what may be going on in the book of Abraham. And that's one of the purposes for looking at this other material is does it provide any extra insight into the text? Yeah, I have two follow-up questions to that. How did you determine where to put Abraham in time and space? And what would you say are the most compelling evidences for that? Well, the, the uh, so putting Abraham in time and place, probably the most compelling. So let's start with the most compelling evidence because this is what drives the rest of it. Um, Book of Abraham says that, talks about Egyptians in Abraham's neck of the woods while he's living there. He has run-ins with a priest of Pharaoh. They're in contact with the, the court. Uh, so you have to have Egyptians up there 
around that time. And somewhere in where Ur is, and which seems to be um, either in Mesopotamia, so this is from the, from the biblical text, Abraham talks about his homeland in two places. He goes out from his homeland, and then he sends his servant back to his homeland to get Rebecca, his wife for Isaac. That homeland, in the second instance, is in the region of Upper Mesopotamia, sort of northern Syria, southern, uh, southeastern Turkey, in that region. Um, and so, and there are some people who would say, well, that's is who want to throw in Mesopotamia. Okay, we'll throw in Mesopotamia. But when you look at when Egyptians are up there, there's really only three time periods before the time of Christ when you have Egyptians up in that area. And uh, the f first of, or the earliest of those is between, in the Middle Kingdom reigns between Sesostris the second or third. Uh, unfortunately, we can't tell you at this point which of those it is. Uh, and we may never know the inscriptions fragmentary. So one of the Sesostruses um, sent up an expedition and troops up into that area. And we have um, some archaeological evidence pointing to the presence of Amenemhate the third there. With Amenemhate the fourth, that seems to disappear either during his reign or just after. Uh, again, we're not quite sure. So that's one time period. And so that's about um, 18, say, 60 to 1800 BC, roughly. The next time period is after the reign of Tutmosis II, um, and this is in the 1500s BC, and the, there's a presence in that area until about 1200 BC during the Middle Kingdom. And then the third time period is in the Ptolemaic period, um, around, say, 250 to 200 BC when Ptolemy III conquers Babylon. So those are three time periods when you got that. Um, and the closest one in to the traditional date of Abraham is the first one. And so it's really that detail from the Book of Abraham which um, drives both the time and the place. And at that point, they, the Egyptians did not cross the Euphrates, so far as I can tell. And uh, they do cross the Euphrates under Tutmosis, but they don't establish a presence there. And then, of course, Ptolemy III conquers Babylon. But the others, the other two places are too late. So that's it's that incidence in the text that drives mainly the time and the place. And there are other, indi there are indications in the biblical text, of course, when Abraham sends a, a, his servant back to get a wife for Isaac, he has a specific spot that's named in the text, and that's in the area of the uh, upper Euphrates and in that area in northern Syria and southern Turkey. And that's at least the general area. So those two happen to coincide and that that's where I get the time and place from. And you know, depending on the chronologies you're using or and whatnot, that you have some sorts of wiggle room there. Um, but it's fairly specific and if you go from the biblical text you, you try to count back to chronology, you end up with um, about a two to three hundred year window on either side of the date when you could place Abraham. So it's really not that specific, the time of place as the book of Abraham gives us. 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I agree that the dating of it is important. Um, my follow-up question to that is what corroborations do you have from that specific time period that you think are the strongest evidences for the book of Abraham? Part of the reason we're doing this is a lot of people are kind of disgruntled about the Howglid article and are feeling like the book of Abraham might not be historical. So we'd like to just hear your perspective on how you uh, came to There's a, that. a large number of them. And that's, so number one that you could, um, so the, the information on putting the Egyptians up there, we had some of the archaeological confirmation. We didn't have any historical inscriptions until an inscription that was published in 2008. So while we could piece it together, and I did in 2004, uh, it's this inscription that was published in 2008 that really tells us uh, that have provides the historical confirmation. Uh, that's the, the mere fact that you could come up with that. And in Joseph Smith's day, this wasn't even thought of. In um, 1912, when the scholars weighed in on the Book of Abraham, they mocked it. They said, this is, the doesn't happen, never happened. In the 1960s, uh, Georges Posner uh, said, this is something that 50 years ago we couldn't have guessed at. And, and then more evidence has come out since then that there is this contact between the Egyptians and the, uh, and the Mesopotamians at that time. Uh, it would be great to have more evidence. But that we have any is surprising. So what's happened is as time has gone along, uh, what was unusual in Joseph Smith's day and unheard of a hundred years ago is now a known factor. So that that's that's not if if Joseph Smith were making up the book of Abraham you would expect that as time went on, it wouldn't get any closer. Uh, or that it would diverge further. So that's, that's one. Um, uh, then we have the, you have a, a place name in the book of Abraham that it doesn't show up in the Bible, but it does show up in a Rimson inscription. And just this year, Earlier this year, a new attestation of that name, Olishem, showed up in an inscription that was just barely published. Um, and there is a tremendous debate in the scholarly literature about where this is located and what's its significant and is it related to this or that other place. And I'm aware of that, but I'm I've tried largely to, um, at this point, put too much weight on a on the exact location of that place because it is so disputed and it hasn't cleared up. Uh, and, but it is the fact that they're proposing concrete archaeological sites for this location tells you uh, and that this is being taken as a real place and it's not something and and again it was a hundred years after Joseph Smith before this any inscriptions really had come to light or nearly a hundred years later uh, so that's also an impressive one the whole notion of human sacrifice so until 1993, this was um, whether there was such a thing as human sacrifice was largely disputed by Egyptologists. Uh, it's now largely on the basis of, of some very good evidence conceded that, that it did exist. And as we look through the evidence of that from Abraham's time, we Abraham's time is the only place where we have 
um, both we have texts that tell about when they would do human sacrifice. You know, one of the texts says, if a man is found in this area who is not a priest about his duties, he will be burnt. And that's, you know, one of the, the pieces of evidence. But we don't know whether that law, which was on the books, was ever enforced. So, but we at least have the legal thing. We also have from Abraham's time at Mergissa, which is a place under Egyptian control, but outside of Egypt proper, archeological evidence for human sacrifice. Clear archeological evidence. Now that's not the only time we have that. There's also some at uh, Baba at a later date. But so we have the archeological evidence and we have a historical inscription that describes when human sacrifice was actually performed. And Abraham's time period is the only time when we have all three of those. Some time periods we have one or two of the evidences, but not all three. So this is, it's, uh, the book of Abraham tends to be very accurate that way. Um, there are other instances like the astronomy described in the book of Abraham um, matches the astronomy we know of from Egypt in Abraham's day. And in one case, there is a play on words that we know is used in Egyptian texts. And we find, at least in translation, what looks like that same play on words in Abraham chapter three. So, um, <coughs> excuse me, Shinaha. Um, there's this term Shinaha in, in Abraham chapter 3, which is said to be the sun. That occurs as a term in Egyptian astronomy for the path of the sun around, uh, which is what we would call the ecliptic, but it's the path of the sun across the sky. And it's attested from the time of the pyramids until Abraham's day. And soon after that, disappears from Egyptian literature. And so, so this is an attested term, uh, Egyptian term, and it shows up in the book of Abraham in the sort of in the, as, as an Egyptian astronomical term, and it's used in the book of Abraham. That's a remarkable thing to try to pluck out of, of uh, out of the air and then have it validated uh, decades after your death. So th there are a number of those um, of, well, if Joseph Smith is guessing, he's a really good guesser. Uh, and so th there are lots of those that I find impressive. Those are just a few of them. And then there are some others that I'm still working on published. Yeah, I definitely find those all very compelling. Um, one thing that has been brought up to me several times, especially with human sacrifice, has been the Rittner article that people will turn to and say that this completely destroys everything. But I, I would like to just take a moment and point out that he contradicts himself in other places well, with that article. Um, but well, how well I mean, that? that yeah, I mean, I'm going back to Rittner's dissertation, which was the one that established that human sacrifice exists. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I understand that he wants to distance. He, on the one hand, this is one of the his big discoveries. So he wants to keep the big discovery, but he wants to distance himself from some of the implications. I understand that why he would want to do that, but um, I think that uh, this is one of the uh, better parts of his published dissertation. Yeah, I agree. Um, how would you respond to someone who says that we don't have enough evidence for the historicity of the Book of Abraham? Well, on the one hand, you never have enough evidence. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> uh, 
if somebody doesn't want to be convinced, no amount of evidence will convince them. Uh, and, you know, you, you, can, you can look at a number of controversial issues. Um, you know, say the, the, the climate change debate. People on both sides, no, matter, no ma amount of evidence convince one way or the other from the position that they hold on that. Uh, so in, in some senses, uh, they say, well, there's not enough evidence. Well, yeah, and in, in, in a certain point, no amount of evidence will work. And that's even what uh, Alma says in Alma 32, is that you have a, that even if you saw a miracle, it wouldn't give you faith. And so, on the other hand, uh, at a certain point, you have to ask, well, you start asking the question, well, what would it take? What possible discovery would it take to convince somebody of the Book of Abraham or not? And when you start looking at at the sorts of things that they described, they're either going to be impossible to find. Um, you know, if um, or there, or if you put it to them, would if you had this evidence, would that convince you? The answer would actually be no. So. Um, at a certain point, uh, if you don't have a, uh, if, if God can't convince you that Joseph Smith was a prophet, you pray about that and, and you, you can get a witness from God or you're not going to, um, take one anyway, uh, then nothing that a scholar can do will, Persuade you one way or the other. I, I can point to you controver scholarly controversies where um, people on different sides of the divide will not budge, no matter what. Even, even when they've been demonstrated to be wrong, they will not budge. And, and so, you know, that. Uh, the best that we can do is we just, we keep doing research and as we notice things and we can publish the research and show yes, this is consistent. Again, this is historical plausibility. We can't, we can show that it's plausible, that it matches that, but it's not a proof of authenticity. And we, re we realize that, that that's, and uh, you know, if, if, if you're convinced that something is a forgery, then nothing will convince you that it's real. And the, the best that you can do is you can make a plausible case for it. Yeah, I totally agree. One thing that we've been talking a lot about on this show, even though it's been four episodes, it's been good, um, is the balance between revelation and scholarship and this idea that seems to have been lost that while you do your scholarship, right? Like we have this interesting spiritual, physical dichotomy um, that I think postmodernism has really deconstructed to say that the two are not compatible. Um, how do you find compatibility with this in your own study of the Book of Abraham? Um, well, I, let, let's just start off with, with something that I've been, that a quote that it's been attributed or a position that's been attributed to me and it's accurate um, is that I've never gotten a spiritual confirmation of the book of Abraham the way I have with the book of Mormon or with Joseph Smith and first vision. Um, and so I really am working on the, the scholarly thing, but in another sense, you, on the one hand, you get 
um, you can work on scholarship and get inspiration on that. Not that that figures into what you write up, um, but you can get inspired as to where to look or uh, in some cases, how to look at something. And, but in your, that doesn't, when you're writing scholarship, that doesn't go in. You, because that's not the way scholarship works. Uh, even if you, and even if you get prompted to find something, then it doesn't, um, it doesn't relieve you from the, um, the need to continue to do your homework. Um, so, and, and one of the things I, I put forth to people who, and there are people who've gotten a spiritual confirmation of the book of Abraham. That's great. Um, I think that the Lord expects a whole lot more out of me when it comes out to studying and out of my mind than he does other people. Uh, simply because I've been blessed with the tools to do the homework. So when he expects me to study it out in my mind, I have a lot more that I need to do. Um, and the other one I would example I was, is years ago when I was working on the collected works of Hugh Nibley, we were checking all of Nibley's footnotes. There's a book we could not find anywhere. Uh, it turned out it wasn't in the card catalog, but it was in the library. And one day I was just wandering around the stacks, um, not particularly looking for anything and just turned around and there the book was on the shelf. Now that may have been inspiration, but I still had to open the book and I still had to check the footnotes and I still had to do all the stuff you do. Uh, but I never would have found the book otherwise. And that's the, how we found out, uh, no, this book actually isn't, it's in the library, but the card catalog either was never made up for it or you know, so it just wasn't there. And so you could look it up and part of the reason for that is that the title page was missing. And it's, um, and, but the interesting thing is I've looked at that book in, um, in a number of other Egyptological libraries and they're also missing the title page. So I don't even think it was printed with a title page. So the publication information is there and you can use it but I've never seen a, an actual copy of the book that has the publication information found in the book. Really interesting. Yeah, I told I like what you said because I feel like a lot of the time when people talk about religious scholars, they'll assume that because a person is religious that their scholarship will be tainted. But religion doesn't remove the burden of proof that you have when you're doing your no. academic work. You still have to provide evidence. No, and, and, and part of it, if you look at, at some of the work that I've done on the Book of Abraham, this isn't true of, of all, all my work, but for some of the stuff in the Book of Abraham, I originally presented this at secular scholarly conferences, and in some cases is published in secular venues. This has been looked at by my peers. Um, and so, and part of that's a check on, you know, is does this pass master? And is this based on a sound argumentation? Because they can look at it and say, yes, this is, or, yes it is, and yes, it, or no, it's not. But, uh, but I've actually done that with my work. And, um, and I noticed some people who um, don't like my work, that's probably fair. Some cases I don't think much of theirs, but, you know, at least it's what I can say about it is that some of the, the critics that I have who've gone after me haven't done that. And 
So at least I have made efforts to make some of these arguments in among my secular colleagues and get their feedback on it. And I mean, and if you're going to talk about tainting, um, I think there are a lot of areas where you can't avoid your personal positions tainting your work one way or the other. So that, um, you know, that, an, say, an atheist sociologist work on the sociology of religion can be influenced by his atheist position or it may be influenced by his the religious position or, and sometimes it it influences it in particular ways and so for example um, if you look at the national survey of youth and religion national studies of youth and religion this is a huge project that was all started because a sociologist wanted to test claims that were being made in his church. And lots of great material that came out of that material. And it was all started because of a concern in his particular denomination. And one that he showed was unfounded. But he used that as a, said, okay, I'm gonna test this theory and produced an immense amount of good work on, out of it. And it was all spurred by his particular religious position. And I think that's entirely legitimate. Uh, he's, it's not dictating his results, but it is giving the impetus to actually do the research and test the study. That's a really fascinating story. And I agree. I think our influences do bring us down different paths, but that's, but those paths still require us to provide argumentation, logic, reasoning, and evidence for our, our positions. One question that I did have with respect to that is, do you think there will ever be a time where the book of Abraham is accepted as a secular document to study as an, like as an ancient secular document to study? Yes and no. Okay. In one way, it already has. Um, I have a book that's written by somebody who's not a member of the church um, discussing um, at least the potential of the Book of Abraham accurately reporting a testable archaeological um, uh, as, a, as a testable archaeological hypothesis that he would indicate it as positive for. And so, but um, I think that's going to be the exception and not the rule. And if you look at what's happened in uh, so you look at what's happened with the Book of Mormon, which is probably more indicative. Um, a few years back, someone I know um, approached a, a big name religious studies journal. Uh, you'd recognize the name if I mentioned it where he was looking at the content of the Book of Mormon and taking it seriously. And the journal said, yeah, we're interested in this. And then they, and they ran it through a set of peer reviews. And then they ran it through another set of peer reviews and said, no, we're, we're not going to publish this. And because it took the Book of Mormon seriously. So, uh, and, you know, and there were, and, and this had, article had been crafted not to get, I mean, it, as to not foreground any of those 
in terms of it took it seriously as a document. And that was considered unacceptable by this uh, very mainstream journal. Uh, and if you look at recent uh, things that supposedly take the Book of Mormon seriously outside, uh, done outside the church, it's only as a 19th century document, as something that Joseph Smith wrote. That's the only way that they'll take it seriously. I suspect that the Book of Mormon and the Book of Abraham will be that way, um, at least within our lifetimes. I don't, I have a, I, I don't, I'd have a hard time seeing how it would ever be otherwise. But that's, uh, but I don't see it happening, at least within my lifetime, and probably not within yours as well. Um, yeah, we might get surprised, but I, I, you know, I just don't see it happening. And uh, most of the time, to get it published in the non-Mormon press, you have to make concessions about whether you accept it as an ancient book. You either have to bracket that, or if you if you do, or you have to take a different preview. It's fine to take it as a 19th, in the secular press, it's fine to take it as a 19th century document, but uh, they wouldn't accept it if you took it as an ancient work. Yeah, I, I've definitely seen a lot on that. And I feel like a lot of the people who appeal to scholarship within the church um, take the more progressive view that Joseph Smith wrote it and that they take it as a 19th century document because- That's not a progressive view. Oh. That, that, uh, that, it's interesting that you would pick that term, but that's not a, a progressive view. It's an old view. So when the Book of Mormon was first published, it was that's true. So this isn't progressing to anything. This is that's just true. The same. It's it's, and if that's the point we're at, then why are we calling that progressive? Does that mean that the only way we're going to be moved forward is if we give up on the Book of Mormon, claiming it to be what it is, or um, that's, so I, I don't like that term because on one hand, I don't think it's accurate. And I have, um, plenty of friends who, uh, would probably describe themselves as progressive, but don't take that view, or at least Interesting. It's politically as progressive, but that's a, a different, um, that's a different category, and I don't think that's helpful to apply that to that term to that point of view. Yeah, that's a fair point. Um, yeah, I just used it because of the association I often see between the two, but that's a, yeah, that's well, there, a fair point. There, there, is, there are some associations there, but they're not across the board. And, and True. I... As I say, I've got friends who are who would describe themselves as politically progressive, but who do not accept the view that the Book of Mormon was 19th century. And in fairness to them, um, I I'll at least rise to their defense. Do it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so next question. But, <laughs> yeah, we wanted to know. We have a couple. We have a couple crowd submitted questions. Um, so okay. these are a little bit more fun. What's your favorite extra biblical Abrahamic story? Ooh. <laughs> um. You know there there are a lot of so favorite in what sense? Okay, so. Um, so I'm going to put out two, and they're for two very different reasons. So I'll explain the difference in the reasons. Perfect. One of them is there's this topic account that has a lot of parallels with the Book of Abraham. 
and um, and it's fun because it probably has the most parallels with the Book of Abraham, and it comes from Egypt. And and so in some ways that's my favorite. And but there is this other, there's a group of them, and it's just one of the details in them. Uh, and it comes from the Muslim accounts. And they tended to get, as time went on, get more and more elaborate. And so there's this point where they get Abraham sacrificed in the flames. They've made the flames so hot that nobody can get close to them. So they launch Abraham by means of a catapult into the flames. And while he's flying through the air, he has this big, long dialogue with the angels. And the angels are trying to save him. And he says, no, don't save me. God will save me. <clears throat> now, this is very different from the book of Abraham, where the angel saves them, where the angel does save Abraham. But the fact that they have pages and pages of dialogue all of this moment when he's flying through the air that you wonder how long of a trip this is that they could get that much into it. Why? Yeah. <laughs> What's the distance and the speeds involved? That, that sounds so fun. <laughs> and why would the catapult shot alone not kill him? <laughs> So that one's those are kind of fun that way, but there are there are a lot of them, and um, and there are different reasons why I like different versions, um, and certain details that I like that are in one of them was the absolute most boring thing to translate, and I translated the whole thing, and it was um, excruciating. <laughs> And it's in the traditions volume, um, and I think it's the Firmicus Maternus one. It's this astronomical treatise where they're describing what they say Abraham learned about astronomy, and it's basically you have this many stars in this constellation, and then you have this many stars in this constellation. Yeah. <laughs> Those and are even the worst. author is trying to reach for vocabulary that isn't monotonous. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, and it's, it's really, but it was so boring. <laughs> yeah, no, that sounds really boring. Yeah, I remember translating that ship book in the Iliad when I was younger. Yes. And I thought, yeah, the ship catalog, it was hard. <laughs> in the Iliad, yeah, well, um, Linhart Euler had that thing memorized. And, uh, Linhart Euler, and he was, he was the... Swiss mathematician who spent most of his time in Russia. And one day he was just kind of thinking it through and um, recalled this line that he had memorized in that and, um, and then computed all the mathematics behind it. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like you got a lot of time on your hands if you can do that. <laughs> Well, Euler did spend the last several years of his life completely blind. And so every, <laughs> but he was all still productive. And so he would, um, but he was doing all of it from what he had from memory. That's amazing. That's really fascinating. Was, so uh, yeah. that was one of your questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the next question um, submitted by someone who watches the show was what is your favorite part about being a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? Which I thought was a hard question to answer. I know, I was it is a, that is a hard question. It's like that's a, everything? <laughs> so repeat the question again so I've got it right. Yeah, what is your favorite part about being a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? Probably is true. That's the best answer you could have given. 
um, the follow-up question that they had was, what, what was the best experience that you've had in the last five to 10 years while reading scriptures that you feel comfortable sharing? Okay. So, um, well, one that I feel comfortable sharing is that, so I just came out with a book and um, after I'd sent in the final draft, I was reading in um, Second Nephi and there is this absolutely beautiful half verse that somehow I'd never picked up on before, but it's just perfect for the book. And we managed to get it. You know, um, let the, the editor thought that it was good enough to, to put in after the final version had supposedly been submitted. That's really cool. That's super cool. We have one last question for you, and I think it's the best question of all. What are you presenting on at the Fair Mormon Conference, and why should we all listen to your presentation? Um, okay. Um, my presentation is called By the Numbers. Um, now, I guess maybe some people think I'm going to be talking about the facsimiles. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> What I'm looking at, and this, this relates to the, the book that I just published, what I'm looking at is what the social science studies tell us about, be, have, about defending the church effectively. There's a lot of material, and largely when it comes to providing defense of the church. So this is part of, of Fair Mormon's podcast, and you know, this is what Fair Mormon does. But we've, we've run to a great extent on anecdote and experience, usually painful experience. Uh, we know what, uh, we're a bit like Thomas Edison in the light bulb. We, we know how to do it right because we've done it wrong so many times. Um, and so we, we swapped stories about success and failure, but largely most of the people who go to, to Fair Mormon, um, you know, are trying to find material to help them in really painful tragedies that they've seen in their family, uh, in their own lives, things that they want, um, they want help with. And, and Pharaoh's done a great job and learned a great deal, but largely what we've done in apologetics has been without the benefit of good data. And so there, in some cases, there is data out there. And so my presentation will be trying to show what data is out there and some of what it tells us about what we can or should be doing and how maybe to do things or how not to do things or, and, and some of what this data can tell us specifically is applied to those who are interested in defending the church or getting answers. And that's what my presentation is going to be on is um, it some time to try to figure out what, um, what that data could tell us. Now, I'm sure there are better ways or there are, you know, if I were a sociologist, I'd design a study that would actually um, answer some of the questions that are out there. This is largely looking at studies that other people done, have done that actually contain some interesting and useful material. 
and that's what I'm presenting. I'm really excited to hear that presentation. I think it should be really great and should help us, especially here at Fair and Warmer, learn more. And thank you so much for taking the time to interview with me today. I learned a lot and I'm sure a lot of people will appreciate hearing what you have to say. You were the most requested person to have on the show. So. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised, surprised and maybe a little flattered. Uh, well, thank you, Hannah, for uh, being a good interviewer. Thank you. Awesome. I'll see you at the Fair Mormon Conference. All right. Thanks. Thank you again to Professor John Gee for that excellent interview. I'm really looking forward to your presentation by the numbers. You can watch this presentation too if you sign up for the 2020 Fair Mormon Conference. Again, sign up for the 2020 Fair Mormon Conference. It's $59.95, but you get a lot of really great things in, in that package and you get to watch all the presentations, submit questions, that sort of deal. It should be really fantastic. So upcoming this week, we have the Sunday special. The Sunday special this week will be very exciting. So we have the typical Come Follow Me series that we're doing, which I've been really enjoying, but we also have a really special topic. Some of you may know that the book Producing Ancient Scripture came out. Um, so this book talks about Joseph Smith's translation projects and the developments of Mormon Christianity. Um, over the course of this book's release, there have been several criticisms raised, um, both from the book and outside the book, that seem to challenge historicity claims and other such things. I will be responding to all of that. I'll be responding to what critics of the church are saying about the highly anticipated Wayment Wilson Lemon paper, um, as well as how Glid's paper, the reception of that. So that should be a really interesting episode. I have been preparing for this one for a while, and I'm really looking forward to taking you through my thought process and the thought process of others on how to respond to these claims. Anyways, I really appreciate you listening to the show. Please make sure to subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts. Just do it right now subscribe. It really does mean a lot. Share it with your friends. Um, if you have any suggestions for the show, I will be definitely re reading my email. So you can email h-s-e-a-r-i-a-c at fairmormon.org. That is h-s-e-a-r-i-a-c at fairmormon.org. I will take your questions. I will take your suggestions. I love them. Anyways, thank you so much for listening to the show and I hope you tune in again for the Sunday special and see you at the Fair Mormon Conference.